everyone. Uh, my name is David Fitzgerald. I co-host this uh, center's um, activities today with our friends from the Center for the Study of International Migration at UCLA on Kay Young Park's uh, new book, LA Rising, Korean Relations with Blacks and Latinos After Civil Unrest. This is part of our ongoing book series. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about Professor Elizabeth Cohen's new book, Illegal, How America's Lawless Immigration Regime Threatens Us All. You can find information about all of our activities on the websites of both the Center for the Study of International Migration at UCLA and the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego. Uh, but today we'll be talking about Professor Park's book. Uh, she will present for about 25 minutes. Then we'll have a discussion by Professor Rocio Rosales, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology at UC Irvine um, and a former fellow at CCIS. So welcome back, Rocio. Uh, then we will kick it back to Professor Park for a, a quick response and then open up the general discussion. Uh, the way we'll run the general discussion is that if you have a question or a comment, please put that into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Or if you would like to ask your question live, uh, please raise your hand uh, to be unmuted for a live uh, question and response. So without uh, further ado, please welcome Professor Park. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm uh, really thankful to CSIM and CCIS at UCLA and also UC San Diego, and uh, particularly Professor Roger Waldinger and Sophia Tam, and also here uh, Professor Fitzgerald. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen. It's not, 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 I'm getting the wrong slide, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so I start with my thesis, um, the uh, 1992 Los Angeles River and West. And I would like to remind you, it happened actually uh, exactly around this time, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and I'm fortunate uh, to be able to commemorate it uh, with my book talk. So uh, 1992, Los Angeles and West involved uh, Black Korean tension and Latino Korean relations. And uh, I conceptualize as racialized class and cultural conflicts. So my uh, various chapters analyze, uh, for instance, the question about uh, race and racism, you know, class and class conflict, and yeah, several chapters, and also on culture and cultural clash. All right, so uh, my thesis is that uh, different racial minorities such as African Americans, Korean Americans, and Latinos are positioned uh, in a different way uh, to uh, uh, really uh, the uh, US racial hegemony, uh, capitalism, and national identity, uh, national integration or symbolic integration. So I mean, because I, I uh, you know, uh, see here that uh, minorities are uh, really, you know, they have a different uh, access. I mean, in a way that they are positioned in a different way to various elements of inequality and I, I am operationalizing here, uh, US race, racial hegemony, capitalism, or you can say racial capitalism and national integration or symbolic integration or politics of citizenship. And, and uh, furthermore, uh, uh, these, you know, uh, uh, different access to uh, uh, US racial hegemony, capitalism, and national identity uh, is impacting on 
the relationship uh, among minorities uh, and impacting in a different way. Therefore, it creates social political barriers and abstract meaningful social relationship among African Americans, uh, Latinos, and Korean Americans. So analytically, I, I see here that different axes of inequality, uh, those are uh, race, race and racial conflict, class and class conflict, and culture and cultural clash, and politics of citizenship. Uh, in the end, it made an indelible impact on racial minorities, and furthermore, their relationship with one another. One another. So, in the end, uh, actually. It uh, constituted and contrib contributed to a multi tiered uh, racial cartography. Uh, that's what I call, and that affected how uh, Angelinos, whether they are Latinos, African Americans, or Korean Americans, think about you know, others, other minorities, and themselves, and also interacted with each other. Right, so I use uh, new Marxist uh, Gramscian analysis with the emphasis on racialized capitalism and also critical race class theory because I'm looking at here how uh, racism is constructed um, at the public sphere and uh, political sphere, which appear to be, you know, fair and just, and uh, yeah, but in fact, it is uh, uh, racially uh, organized. I would say that, and minorities participate, you know, to the limited extent. So I pay attention to the role of really racial formation, but state and non-state, and particularly through culture and economics. So uh, Omi and Winant already talked about, you know, racial formations through uh, state, state and political sector, but I am paying attention to market sector and also, you know, public spheres such as media. So I'm looking at here, uh, media and uh, police and criminal justice system and government and educational settings, or we can add like financial you know, institutions, uh, how it really played a role. Right, so our, our core, uh, my theoretical framework is unitary conceptual framework on in on inequality. So it's kind of intersectionality framework, but I am taking it to relating it to race and class and citizenship and culture. Uh, so uh, really, you know, intersectional way and, and uh, demonstrating that the single axis framework, you know, uh, only using analytically the dimension of race uh, isn't sufficient here, doesn't explain really, yeah, uh, so, or even gender, right, among uh, anti-racist and feminist scholars. Uh, so I view here how different groups are racialized uh, in different way, in related yet distinct ways. So I analyze the importance of social class, citizenship, and culture uh, in structuring uh, interactions. Right, so I think just because it happened uh, uh, 30 years ago, so I would like to remind you of the most controversial ethnic tension, Black Korean tension, and that was about really, uh, you know, African, African American teenager was killed by a Korean grocer over shoplifting dispute and, um, uh, you know, Judge Kalin didn't give any, didn't deliver any sen sentence term uh, just on probation and which very much angered um, African-American community. Uh, looking at it, it's the same thing, like, you know, police officers who beat Rodney King uh, in, in a way that he couldn't stand up. Uh, they, they think that uh, is the uh, Korean grocer received the same Sentence racialized, and not a you know black sentence, nor a white sentence is kind of multicultural Asian Americanist sentence. All right, so here is a flyer that uh, yeah they call uh, this woman owns a Buddha market and then boycott. 
All right, so I uh, uh, see here that black orientation can be explained by just, uh, you know, something to do with African Americans, something to do with the Korean Americans, because uh, it it involved uh, white uh, power, I would say that. So the instigating role of whiteness, in other words, that when the judge Colin delivered the kind of racialized sentence. Uh, so I think I'm looking at here as a triad, okay? And uh, yeah. I just to, to remind you that, as I mentioned, uh, white police officers, they are acquitted non-guilty verdict and that led to uh, 1992 Los Angeles civil unrest. And just uh, to uh, refresh our memory, uh, you know, it led to this kind of uh, over 700 million in damages and uh, actually half the financial damage has been done to the Korean American community and uh, rioters or the, those people who are arrested, uh, half of them were Latinos and one in three were uh, African Americans. So yeah, uh, more than 2,300 Korean owned businesses, uh, they were, you know, affected, damaged or destroyed or looted. Okay. Uh, and at that time uh, in 1992, the percentage of Korean American population in LA was just a little over 1%. All right, so it, it has started with a uh, well-organized rally in front of LAPD Paco Center, uh, really protesting, you know, this police violence and and that's the entrance to Koreatown because riot started in South LA and uh, majority merchant at that time were Korean immigrants. And then also when rioters moved up north, then it was a uh, Koreatown. And uh, yeah, uh, this is how uh, uh, one of my uh, informants, uh, his liquor store in South LA was uh, destroyed. Um, overnight. And you can see here uh, graffiti on the wall that uh, in explaining really 1992 was in the civil unrest and Rodney King, you know, uh, beating police violence uh, was a immediate uh, cause, although that's not how media uh, really reported, uh, but, or, but also uh, Sun Jadu, Korean grocer and Latasha Hallins, that incident also uh, factored into. So uh, yeah, uh, Korean Americans organized the largest uh, rally because uh, Koreatown was not protected. And uh, as you know, LAPD decided not to, you know, uh, uh, I mean, because they, so they didn't have enough resources and also they, there is no point to endanger themselves. Uh, and basically Koreatown uh, was, didn't exist, <laughs> I would say that, uh, as worthy to protect. I mean, we, we can see if a Korean immigrant merchant or white merchant, you know, white American merchant, maybe things have been different. So, okay, analytically, I look at here, uh, Black Korean tension, how to explain it. Uh, and I uh, analyze it uh, really uh, how, you know, uh, tension has developed. Uh, so social construction of tension development. And also, I don't think we can explain it by identifying just a single cause, you know? Uh, so I try to look at the mechanism, how it has developed. And over time, so race and racism play the negative role, you know. So when I talk about race, uh, I'm, I'm uh, relating it to white racism at the criminal justice system, police and media and educational settings and financial institutions. But also I do talk about subaltern racism. So uh, Korean immigrant merchant, they are almost like a biological racism towards African-Americans and also African-Americans because you know, merchants were not treated well. They, they were even physically assaulted or uh, ridiculed, you know, disrespected. So uh, I think uh, also, uh, 
uh, Korean immigrant merchant uh, complained about this lack of respect at African-American customers. They had also Orientalist and nativist racism. Uh, Although, you know, subbelt and racism is different from uh, like white racism or structural racism because it didn't have any white privilege, but still it led to a question of interracial justice, you know, and still it was uh, dangerous, I would say that. All right, and citizenship also played a negative role, you know. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, also culture. Uh, I mean, some Korean immigrant merchants, the way they uh, conducted the business, their uh, business practice was seen as very parochial and, um, and sometimes seen as uh, racist, you know, like they don't make eye contact, they wouldn't give a change directly to the hands of their customers, they don't smile, those things. Uh, yeah, and also class, you know, uh, between uh, Korean immigrant, but the bourgeois small business owners and uh, African-American working class and also under, under poor or urban poor, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, although we are talking about really just the relationship between merchant and customers, but uh, yeah, it was in a way quasi-class uh, Tension. All right, so it led to four degree of separation. But when you look at Korean Latino relations, uh, dynamics are very different. Uh, eventually, it led to two degree of separation and two degree of conver convergence. So uh, I, uh, you know, identified uh, the status as uh, of Korean Latino relation as respect for caution. So for instance, um, race and racism didn't play negative role and also citizenship didn't play negative role, uh, but culture and class, particularly class because majority uh, workforce a Korean immigrant owned business establishment. Uh, you know, they were Latino workers. So often it was a matter of really labor relations and sometimes it could develop into ethnic tension. Uh, but uh, yeah. All right, so uh, uh, I move on to analytical interventions. Uh, so I argue here that uh, US society has moved from white over black, the kind of bipolar, you know, uh, racial framework uh, uh, to multipolar racial framework or racial formation. It's not multicultural, uh, you know, just adding Asian Americans or Latinos, it doesn't explain. And I'm not saying uh, we, we are able to put an end to anti-black racism, uh, but I think we, we can explain it as a matter of just white, black, bipolar racial formation because white suprem supremacy really operates in a different way. And then also often uh, at major racial incident, you know, either Latinos or Asian Americans have played a very important role. So I think uh, epistemologically, we have to give independent entity to uh, Latinos and Asian Americans. So I would say that complex negotiation of multipolar relationships is an unfolding multi-tiered racial cartography. So it's like a racial matrix, you know, and it's inflected on multiple axes, not single X uh, by class, citizenship and culture. So I will also show you. All right, so racial cartography. Uh, I, I was inspired by Claire Kim's, uh, you know, notion of field of racial positions, but uh, I differ from her uh, because I'm also using other, you know, concepts. For instance, cognitive mapping uh, that how people, in this case, racial minorities, they map out their distance, their relationship, you know, uh, with each other and then also with even majorities. Uh, and then also how they map out their, you know, uh, class and also cultural and racial distances or relationship. Uh, so I, I would say that these are the underlying really, you know, Black Korean tension. All right. Um, 
So I, uh, you know, view here that uh, there is a unequal and differential power relations, not just between white and black, but also uh, among different minorities and pertaining to race, class, and citizenship. So the really question is, how do people in South LA view others and themselves even though, though they were physically close to each other, but uh, historically that has not been the case. You know, as you know, uh, they they were often segregated to different you know social settings. Uh, so with the uh, not just the racial hierarchy. Uh, so, you know, the question of racial status and entitlement, but also racial distance, you know, how do they measure their uh, really relationship and social distance and, uh, and in some cases leading to racial tension. So still in this racial cartography, uh, white Americans at the top and African Americans and Native Americans are at the you know right and uh, bottom because uh, because I think Asian Americans and Latinos are seen not fully granted really national belonging or symbolic integrations. Okay, uh, despite the century of presence contribution and struggles in the US. I mean, what uh, African-Americans are saying here is that African-Americans struggled a lot, uh, but they were not recognized. They contributed a lot to build this society. Uh, still, they were not recognized and they had to uh, protest, you know, and yet still they are not recognized. So it's just, uh, you know, uh, if you make more money, doesn't mean it's, it's translating into higher racial status. All right, so I map out here racial positions and the uh, vertical one is a socioeconomic indicator. So it's a proxy for class and horizontal one is a uh, right of prior occupancy. So from African-Americans perspective, Latinos and K Korean immigrants are, you know, newcomer, okay? So they have yet to, you know, uh, really contribute to the society and also struggle, you know, so these uh, uh, residency in the US or in South LA is a proxy for citizenship. So particularly cultural citizenship, I would say that. Uh, and I think we have to admit here that minorities have been stratified. There have been significant gaps in socioeconomic status between these groups. Uh, all right, and the model is uh, flexible because in the future, if Korean Americans and Asian Americans, uh, they really, you know, uh, contribute and uh, yeah, uh, more integrated to the society or their integration is recognized, then they can move to the right. Okay, uh, I better yeah, show you my uh, diagrams and uh, figures. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, racial distancing is really how each minorities, you know, feel about uh, other minorities, their distance, okay? So uh, I agree with the rebus that we can talk about whether race relation is good or bad, you know, that's too simplistic uh, because using rebus prismatic uh, engagement, you know, uh, saying that uh, the sense of group position it is shaped through the distorting optic of the prism of white dominance. Therefore, if there are same white and African American manager, people think that it's all right, you know, to be disciplined by the white manager, but um, they don't think it's, uh, you know, there is a legitimacy in being subjected to discipline by African American uh, manager, and also uh, uh, Michelle Ramon, symbolic boundaries, as I already mentioned, uh, yeah, in measuring uh, distance. All right, I already mentioned that African Americans, they do say they shed their, you know, blood, I mean, sweat and tear and yet they are not fully recognized. So uh, really Latinos and Af Korean Americans have a long way to go, you know? Uh, so, and also Latinos and Korean Americans agree that African Americans have been uh, politically, socially and culturally an insider. All right, so this is a national racial cartography and 
vertically is a really socioeconomic indicator or what I call household income above taxable minimum and uh, you know horizontal x axis is centuries present within US you know foundation of US nation state uh, independence uh, since 1776 so uh, uh, definitely we will have to locate indigenous people to the right and then, you know, African Americans like 1619 Project, uh, some of them, they were here, they were brought here. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, Latinos after US-Mexico War, so Latinos are kind of in between. Uh, uh, but I think the socioeconomic indicator is uh, actually Asian Americans uh, socioeconomic indicator is higher, but poverty rate is uh, higher too. So I lowered, so it looks like uh, this way. Uh, and uh, when I look at uh, LA uh, racial cartography, then because LA was founded by, uh, you know, a uh, group of people, multiracial from Mexico, uh, including uh, Africans. So I think uh, Latinos needs to be situated to the right, you know, and um, yeah, so I think that is the major difference. Uh, and in, in South LA, uh, Latinos position has been lowered because in South LA, their socioeconomic indicator has been uh, is lower than African Americans. So in a way, uh, those Latinos have been uh, blackened. Um, yeah. So multipolar racial formations, that means uh, Asian Americans and Latinos subject to differential racialization from African Americans and uh, also from each other, from the state and civil society. I already mentioned the subaltern racism, uh, you know, uh, they act white or, or, or black, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think these racial minorities have been victims of white supremacy, but also complicit in it as well, and influenced by class inequality and immigrant citizenship status. And uh, after the unrest, it led to pan-ethnic racialization when we see coalition building between established Mexican-American Chicano leadership and Central Americans uh, or racial interpolation. I mean, Korean American Americans did stand in for uh, Asian Americans and cross racial class formation among Korean Americans and Latinos over immigrant rights issues and over labor issues, you know, Latino hotel workers, supermarket workers, and um, garment factory workers, and uh, what else? Yeah. Uh, so, and immigrant rights uh, uh, yeah. issues. Uh, so yeah, Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance, they ad advocated, they organized, you know, Latino and also Korean workers. Yeah. Immigrant uh, rights issues, again, organized by Kiwa. And uh, unfortunately, after the unrest, there is a continuing black reintention because there is an anti-liquor store movement uh, and liquor store owners are mostly Koreans. So, but anyway, so yeah. Uh, but finally, like, you know, uh, almost 20 years later, uh, there was an effort to reconcile. So uh, both, uh, African-American community and Natasha Halin's family members and Korean-American community leaders and activists, uh, they met. So yeah, so I think that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Park. Um, Professor Rosales. Um, so thank you so much for that presentation. Dr. Park, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. I was impressed with the depth and breadth of the field work, the observations, the interviews, and the archival analysis. Um, the timing of all that work is also extraordinary with field work starting in January of 1992, several months before the 1992 uprising in April. Um, of that year, and then culminating in 1997 with another revisit in 2002. The 142 life histories and ethnographic, ethnographic interviews that you and your research team collected represent an impressive body of work. 
And the stories captured in these pages help explain and preserve an important moment in South LA history. I appreciate your conceptual contribution of racial cartography and believe it offers great insight into intergroup tensions and relations in an American context full of changing demographic characteristics. Your book made me think of a memorable passage in the 1968 Kerner Commission report, which you bre referenced briefly in the introduction. Uh, and this report investigated the 1967 acts of civil disobedience in ma various major American cities. The particular passage from the Kerner report that I'm talking about that has struck with me all these years later after, after reading it uh, states, and I quote, segregation and poverty have created in the racial ghetto a destructive environment totally unknown to most white Americans. What white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. Dr. Park, I believe your work in analyzing inter-ethnic relations between African-Americans, Latinos, and Koreans in 1990s South Los Angeles does a wonderful job of accounting for the role of white supremacy or white racism in structuring inequality among these groups. As you explain in chapter two, white dominated spheres of media, criminal justice, policymaking, and leadership help structure the inter-ethnic tension in South LA and our perception of it. Your model of racial cartography further expands our understanding of intergroup relations by focusing on the role of race, citizenship, class, and culture as important axes of inequality. I do have a few questions that arose as I move through your text. This racial cartography model works well in explaining relationships in South LA before and after the 1992 uprising. But I wonder if this model also works well in this study because of the sheer volume of academic studies, media attention, and political analysis following that uprising. How might we usefully extend this model to other less studied and lesser known cases of intergroup tension? And to get a little bit more in the weeds, I wanna focus on a critique you had of black business and activist Danny Blackwell, Bakewell, sorry, who organized boycotts uh, against Korean owned businesses following the Du Harlings tragedy, which you explained in your presentation was uh, the incident that involved a Korean shopkeeper shooting and killing a black teenager following a dispute about a presumed theft. Um, this happened in 1991. In the book, you write that Bakewell's concern did not move beyond a somewhat narrow and simplistic emphasis of on black capitalism. Neither did he challenge white supremacy as an oppressive system or analyze its economic or psychological impact. Bakewell's protest and reasoning seem to be supported by various entities in the community, including, as you note, black churches, black activists, and the black women's forum led by representative Maxine Waters. It seems that the critique of Bakewell's failure to understand the complexity provided Bakewell's failure to understand the complexity provided by something like your racial cartography model, which makes me wonder if the model takes a top-down approach while some of your interlocutors provide bottom-up understandings of events. How do you reconcile this mismatch in understanding? Is it that some LA Black and Latino residents or Korean merchants only engage with some axes of inequality in their personal cognitive mapping? Meanwhile, you have other respondents who seem to have the capacity to understand the range of forces acting upon. Them. For example, recognizing that the boycotts were rooted in anger towards um, not Korean merchants, but rather towards American society and government as a whole. Um, I wonder if these particular, if there were any particular characteristics among those who have this broad understanding of structure. Um, were, there, were these respondents who had that understanding longer term residents in the community or younger or more socially engaged? In other words, what were the specific characteristics uh, among respondents that allowed them to have this wide angle view of social forces in their lives? I was particularly moved by your discussion of business practices uh, in chapter three surrounding the handling of change and the materialization of racial difference. For those who haven't had a chance to read this great book, in this uh, chapter, 
Uh, Dr. Park writes about Korean business establishments often giving customers change on small plastic trays, which prompted Black customers to wonder why the lack of physical contact existed and whether Korean merchants wanted to avoid touching Black hands. Meanwhile, Korean merchants believed customers did not want them touching their hands due to their aversion of merchants' own yellow hands. The explanatory power of ethnographic research truly shines and your prose sings in these snapshots of interaction. Finally, if time allows, I really would appreciate hearing more of your development of intercessory ethnography and in what spaces and places it can best be deployed. Uh, you know, as a fellow ethnographer, I'm always interested in, in methods and I really was intrigued by this. How did your development and use of this intercessory ethnography influence your development of the racial cartography model? I hope that gives you, us enough for discussion plus any questions that people might have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Park, would you like to take a few minutes to respond before we open it up? Uh, yes, um, only partially because <laughs> I think, um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Rosales. I think uh, really your comments are well taken. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, I think first uh, the question that how this model racial cartography uh, can be applied to other maybe uh, inter-ethnic or ethnic relations, right? Or tensions, those things. I would say that, you know, I think um, uh, right, away, right away, I could think about the relationship between like uh, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, I would say that like in Chicago, uh, because, you know, Puerto, for Puerto Ricans, the citizenship is not a problem, right? But, but you know, uh, Mexicans, uh, uh, it's a legal status, it's important. So you see, even in relation to citizenship, these two groups, they relate in a different way, right? Uh, so I, I, I think uh, I, I would say that uh, probably if we apply to international settings or globally, globally, I think I will have to maybe modify it, you know, uh, but I think this is a really limited uh, nation state like the US, you know, uh, but I think it can be uh, actually applied well, I would say that, you know, I mean, so they are, um, and, I mean, we have to understand that not just, you know, how their cultures are different, but, uh, what has been the history, what has been their strategy, you know, they use, and also how is it interpreted by other groups, you see? So it's really uh, causing, you know, those tensions. So I, I think I haven't uh, really applied to other settings, you know, it's just uh, difficult for me to come up with like two dimensional, <laughs> this kind of, you know, but, but I think actually before this model, I was just thinking about, you know, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, because when I saw the movie, I for, I'm forgetting the title of the movie, Mambo something, you know, <laughs> Was about Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, and it was very clear to me, you know, how they are uh, really coming with different background, different history, you know, and therefore they developed a different strategy, and yet they are related to U.S., you know, uh, racial capitalism in a different way, you see, and, and yet it is causing misunderstandings and tensions, you know. I mean, you know, Puerto Ricans, they hardly understand why Mexican American are so much, you know, concerned about legal status, you know, but then Mexican Americans say, you guys never understand, you know, so, so I, I, I would say that, uh, yeah, I, I think um, I would have to think about it further, <laughs> you know, and I think that's a very good encouragement, but uh, I am very sure, sure that uh, if we try to apply to international settings, I think it's uh, different because uh, I think it's more, you know, uh, yeah, it, it needs a great revision, I would say that, but uh, within the, you know, U.S. nation state and also um, 
yeah, racial hegemony and, and market sectors, and then also symbolic integration, you know? So we are not talking about whether you have a, a legal paper, you know? It's more or less, you know, uh, how you could claim on and how you are treated, you know, with respect as a member of this society. So I think I feel very much encouraged, but that's really all I can say. And unfortunately, even when I look at even Asian American studies, hardly there are any works to analyze inter-ethnic relationship, you know, because we all know that it's, it's a challenge, it's not easy, uh, but, but I think it's just, uh, we don't have it, you know, so, so I, I, I think that's just, uh, I am kind of starting it, I would say that. All right, um, and about, you know, uh, 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 Brotherhood Crusade and uh, Bakewell and Black nationalist, Black capitalist nationalist. Uh, I think uh, I am trying to be kind of cautious here, you know, because, um, because you know, uh, in the book, I just uh, try to capture uh, these African American community organizing, right? Uh, uh, but uh, it wasn't my really objective to really critically examine, you see. Uh, I, I just uh, tried to see how it related to Black orientation, okay? Uh, but I think this is uh, this was a really a problem because uh, when we had the Black orientation and when Bakewell organized the protest and then saying that okay we're gonna boycott any Korean owned businesses we can allow you know uh, but then you know uh, really media mainstream media and also you know even right now he owns you know LA Sentinel ethnic media uh, very powerful and also close friend to Mayor Bradley. Uh, so mainstream media like LA Times always, you know, featured him and treated him as the best leader, community leader, you know? And, and also what I'm saying here is that uh, when he was just saying, we can't allow any Korean immigrants to own businesses, but then nobody in the, within the African-American community could contest or question you know, how you can, you know, disallow, you see? Uh, so, uh, so, and, um, but, but what I found out was later, 20 years later, when I was on the board to produce a documentary about Mayor Bradley, I had a chance to also meet with other African-American, uh, you know, uh, advisors, right? And I realized that it wasn't, uh, Bakewell was perceived in a different way, you see. It's just a one of, you see. But within the Korean American community, he was seen the only important African American community leader, you know. Uh, so Korean American community didn't think about what other ways they could communicate, you know. And then because mainstream media always, you know, uh, really uh, treated him as the only best community leader, you see. Uh, I mean, you know, so so I, I would say that uh, that uh, really uh, complexity. I think I would have to go back, but it wasn't really uh, my goal to uh, critically examine, you know, uh, kind of different voices within the African American community. But but I think um, uh, in my book. Uh, what is described about this black nationalist, you know, like Bakewells and also other groups, you are right, as I mentioned, you know, uh, religious groups and also women's, you know, groups, but they are, you know, uh, their strategy and um, goal was very different from uh, Afri another African-American community organizing like in chapter eight, anti Likosto movement that was mostly organized by African-American women, you know, uh, including Congresswoman Karen Bass. So I just find it like so fascinating there. And then some people are in between or supporting both, you know, parties. So I, I think, again, I think that, uh, you know, it's very encouraging to hear that uh, I think from you and I'll have to look into, you know, what kind of different voices were mediated or not mediated at the time. But, but I think uh, 
uh, it was uh, at the time it was African American, I mean, Korean American community failed to uh, contest that uh, Judge Collins verdict, you know, they actually had a letter writing campaign and asking Judge Collins to, uh, you know, lend the more lenient sentence, you see, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, uh, and that very much angled the African American community, uh, but at the same time, like the African American community also, they failed to express their view different from like ben, uh, Bakewell's. I would say that, yeah. All right, maybe I'm uh, taking too much time here. Um, yeah, I think I, I think you you asked a very important question. I would say that this racial cartography, you know, uh, and as you know. Uh, I was inspired by political scientist, right? Uh, maybe your colleague, right? Claire Kim. Uh, but you know, Claire Kim, as a political scientist, uh, for her, racial triangulation is is based on what the elite are talking about, or oh, media, you know, elite discourse, you see. But in my case, it was uh, more uh, ethnographically in everyday life, you know. But but I would, I would say that when we look at, um, so I, I see more Los Angeles civil unrest is contesting the kind of shifting racial cartography, I would say that, you know? So if a racial cartography uh, was in a way like a racial triangulation, it was like heading and shaped by uh, elite, but then during the unrest, they are challenging, you see? Uh, so so uh, I, I, I would say that uh, even when we talk about not just top down and grounds up, uh, even grounds up, I think it's, uh, many different voices, I would say that, you know, I mean, I can talk about even in relation to right now, you know, this spike in anti-Asian hate crimes, all those things. I think if you talk to people in the community, they have all very different views, you see? And I feel sometimes is, there is an urgent need for, uh, you know, people who are leaders and activists to really, you know, how to leave, you know, uh, the uh, the common people, because otherwise it seems to be dangerous, I would say that. Um, but anyway, um, I will maybe just mention your last, and uh, try to answer your last question about intercessory ethnography. And, uh, and I'm surprised because that, that was one of the popular questions that I got from of course, anthropologist, but also now by sociologist. Um, because, you know, uh, I am not just a professor at UCLA. And uh, when I went to South LA, even Korean immigrants already heard me from radio at the time, you know? So, so I think uh, I wear many different hats, you know, like community leaders and activists. And I couldn't waste a moment when I had a chance to talk to these people. Right away, I had to, I, 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 I I had to intervene, you know, and I had to challenge them like my student, you know, so yeah, because, you know, it's a precious moment and I can't just collect data, you see, uh, I mean, if, you know, a snographer is like uh, uh, some uh, white American from global north, they can record and then they say, this is what the, how Korean immigrants are saying this kind of very stupid things, you know, very prejudiced. But I, I just couldn't just collect the data and then take off, you see. So I had to use right away, I had to challenge, you know, uh, my informant, you know. Uh, so so I, I think that's how I did. And I otherwise I feel that's like very very condescending and uh, paternalistic, you know, that kind of study, I would say that. I, I know that uh, it's not easy, you know, uh, it, it can be done just right away, I would say that. But, but I think even after publishing this book, I do have a challenge, you see, because I think, you know, some uh, people in the community, they don't like that idea. They thought that when they cooperated with me, they expected that, um, 
kind of I'm gonna promote, you know, <laughs> what they are saying. They didn't realize that uh, that's, you know, I have an expectation to critically examine, not necessarily. I mean, like they think that I'm airing the dirty entry, you know, I mean, laundry, right, <laughs> in public. So I, I do have a continuing this kind of challenge, you know, when they cooperate with me, they couldn't believe that when they see published the book how you could they expected that i could talk about only positive things about korean immigrants you know but when it wasn't uh, uh very uh, kind of devastating so i have a continuing challenge i was like, okay i think i took too long okay thank you well we have several questions um the first is a two-part question. So the first part from Lori Hart is, I would be interested in knowing how broadening the frame of reference beyond the US and integrating a sense of the global racial cartography intersecting with historical events like 9-11 and COVID-19 also shifts or redefines the racial cartography. That is not using this model that you developed in LA elsewhere, but the impact of the elsewhere on the national model. Well, I think <laughs> Lori is asking a uh, really tough question. I think in a way that's what the Dr. Rosales also asked. I, I would say that, you know, because I look at here uh, in my mother and I make it very clear, this is really limited to US nation state, you know? Um, but if we view here, uh, different racial minorities, their access to US uh, racial hegemony, uh, and we can say racial capitalism, then I'm viewing US as an empire, and empire operates also globally. So I think that that is why uh, I think right now there is a, an attempt to talk about it together. I would say that even abolitionist in the in the US, you know, <laughs> also globally, I would say that. So maybe I sound very abstract, but, uh, but I think, you know, uh, there, there is a way, I think, uh, uh, Lori, uh, probably we can develop it even globally and the mother is not going to be the same, uh, but, uh, but I think we would have to uh, relate to geopolitics and I would say that and if we understand that like anti-black racism you know perpetuated by the and under the U.S. empire then you and if we understand the U.S. empire also operates globally uh, then I think there is a connection I would say that but I think other than that I, I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of my research but but I think I see very clearly even now you know uh, the way we talk about China <laughs> I, I think you know uh, these uh, geopolitical questions is uh, uh, directly impacting on race relations I mean I mean because unfortunately I would say that even someday, pandemic, our, you know, COVID-19 coronavirus will be over. I think, unfortunately, we're going to still have anti-Asian, you know, violence and hate crime. Why? You know, I mean, and the reason is because uh, this anti-Asian uh, aggression happened even before the pandemic, although we had a spike, you know, and the reason is this is geopolitical things. I mean, as long as politicians, I mean, not just uh, President Trump, but politicians and even in the media, every day they talk about China, you know, bash China and something wrong with China, China as our enemy and threat. And I, I'm not supporting Chinese Communist Party, but what I'm saying here is that, uh, you know, this uh, geopolitics, geopolitical interest, you know, in uh, what the US empire has, domestically and globally, I think it's impacting on race relations. Uh, and uh, I, I would say that uh, right now, you know, even uh, one doesn't have to be white supremacist, but even racial minorities, you know, they just think it might be, because we are all indoctrinated, brainwashed, you know, uh, uh, whatever Chinese, Asian Americans brought this coronavirus. And uh, we, I mean, think that it's a patriotic thing to attack that germ, you know, people who are carrying that kind of germ. And so I, I, I would say that uh, I think Lodi is pushing further, but, uh, but I think uh, uh, I believe uh, already not the scholars, but activists are already connecting 
you know, <laughs> domestic and uh, global matters, and also, also I think you know, um, yeah. So, so I think that's that's all. Or I can say I would say that other than that, I think probably I need more work. I would say that, yeah. Okay, here's a question from Helmer Mara, who writes, Professor Park, do you believe, according to your studies, that Black people consider themselves above other racialized citizens in the U.S. due to their fight for recognition along with U.S. history? If so, what other reasons could keep such motivation in South L.A.? Well, David, can you repeat? I didn't take a look at the questions. Yeah. Sure. It says, do you believe, based on your study, that black people consider themselves above other racialized citizens in the US due to their fight for recognition in US history? If so, what other reasons could keep such motivation in South LA? I think I, I don't necessarily agree with the first the contention that African-Americans see themselves above uh, other minorities, although uh, I, I mean, in my book, I quote, that's one of my interviewees was saying, because uh, they see themselves as, you know, authentic Americans, uh, but see like Koreans and Latinos as not yet really a US citizen, you know? Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, that's kind of a simple way to view it, I would say that. And uh, I, I think really, uh, is, as I mentioned, uh, that's only one dimension, but, uh, but I think uh, African-Americans that I studied in South LA, why they boycotted Korean-owned stores? One of the reasons is because they don't understand why they lacked business ownership, you know? So in their own neighborhood, you know? I mean, in the 60s, it was a Jewish, you know, uh, and other white American merchant, and then now Koreans. And uh, so, so I, I think, you know, uh, in some senses, you know, uh, African-Americans, yes, in relation to, citizenship question and symbolic integration. Uh, they see themselves as an insider than uh, uh, Asian Americans or Latinos, but, but I can say they do it same way in other dimensions or other arenas, you know, definitely they don't understand why they lack business ownership. Although I don't think, uh, you know, business, small business ownership was the thing that African Americans pushed for, you know, after civil rights movement, uh, they pushed for more participation and integration in the po political sector, but uh, non necessary. and, you know, as you know, small business ownership has been a strategy for immigrants, I would say that, yeah. So I, I, I think, um, uh, I, I, I would say that again, uh, I think it's kind of dangerous to, you know, to just to say, okay, you know, whether Black Korean, Latino Korean relation is good or bad, and uh, and then they see themselves as uh, higher than other groups. But I think there is a complexity, and I I would, I would say that we we'll have to look into, uh, so we can find, uh, you know, point of convergence or connections and point of also divergence, I would say that, yeah. So, so I, I, I think, you know, um, even though African-Americans in South LA, they lamented this kind of lack of business ownership, but then the reason is it's not perpetuated by Korean Americans. Korean Americans didn't block, you know, African Americans' business ownership. It was perpetuated by our bank and financial institutions because African Americans just still, when they apply for commercial lo loan, then they are likely to, to be refused, you know. So I think that's what I'm saying. It's like it's not, uh, you know, it's again uh, in relation to maybe white supremacy or white racism, uh, I think it's a bit complex, I, I, I would say that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm forgetting maybe second point, but we can move on to maybe next. Sure, so here's a question from Anisha Patil, building on something that you said at the end of your response mm -hmm. to uh, Rocio. How did conducting this sort of ethnographic research affect your relationships personally? And have you been able to maintain relationships with the people you connected with in your research? Yeah, um, I, I, I would say that uh, 
when I, because uh, I, I, I was interested in really uh, the people in South LA, whether they are Korean Americans and particularly African Americans and then later Latinos, what was their, you know, discourse, okay? how they analyze, how they interpreted it, okay? So I had to use really uh, ethnography, you know, because statistics, those things are rather misleading and not that helpful. Uh, yeah, and, um, and then I think, you know, uh, Lucio read my book, but uh, it wasn't easy uh, really to conduct research in South LA because, uh, because of Black Korean tension already, you know? And uh, I had to really come up with a team of multiracial research assistant because uh, my African-American interviewees, they didn't feel comfortable uh, really talking to, you know, they, they said that uh, they wanna be studied by the people that they can trust. And I thought that, yeah, the uh, role of race, race and ethnicity of the researcher, uh, you know, makes difference. So I tried to come up with a Latino, African American, you know, uh, research assistant. So I, I will say that I conducted the research for a long time, and um, and uh, I think again, uh, Rosia read my book in my chapter five, the Korean merchant and liquor store owner that I observed for a year, and he was murdered actually. I observed in year 2002 and year 2006, the mer merchant were killed, you know? Uh, and he actually got along well with his customers and he didn't have even language barrier or cultural barrier, you know? So uh, I, I, I would say that uh, it's a difficult question. I mean, I am just doing my best to reciprocate, you know, what the people that I studied, they did it to me. And I think that forever I'm indebted. And, but of course I can do everything, you know, uh, but I think I am uh, particularly like even this kind of, you know, murder of my key informant. So uh, I am doing in a way that, you know, whatever in my capacity to try to reciprocate uh, really my informants because they cooperated with me, you know, uh, but, you know, again, that isn't easy. I think you can do it when you are conducting research, but uh, when you are even writing, you know, because uh, writing, uh, writing articles and book, uh, when you do it, you know, it, it isn't like you are writing book and articles together with the people that you studied, because I interviewed more than 100 people. I can't just ask everybody, okay, can you read? And, you know, um, you know, if you have any objections or whether you feel comfortable, you know, uh, I mean, if I have only one interviewee, I could do that, but I had more than near 150 people over a decade. So uh, I, I think really, even though when we try to make this ethnography research process as more democratic between ethnographer and the people we study, uh, but I think when we, when we talk about writing, uh, publishing those things, I still feel it's not really even, you know? So um, I, I don't know, you know, uh, what uh, really better ways. I am I'm really uh, still being a bit uh, agonized over this question, you know? Uh, so yeah, so I would say that and this isn't anything that anthropologists also talked about a lot. We talked about a lot when we are conducting research, how to conduct research more, you know, democratic way, but then when we write, you know, uh, unless you co-author with them, but you know, co-authoring with one interview is one thing, but how can you co-author it with 150 people, you know? So uh, it's, um, it's a very difficult question. And I, I, am, I have a challenge, I would say that, you know, uh, uh, the people who read my book, uh, how they feel about, you know? So, uh, I mean, not only 
in the early 90s when I went to South LA, when I tried to talk to African Americans and some African Americans, they tried to spit on me, you know? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, right, they heard the verdict, you know? So they really didn't like it. They had a problem, uh, you know? Uh, but um, but uh, what, what I'm saying here is that uh, it, I mean, that was expected how to study, how to uh, conduct research among African Americans when we have a still this kind of controversial Black Korean tension, you know. But then, you know, even it wasn't easy to study among Korean Americans, you know, my fellow Korean Americans. That isn't easy either because if we include what I write, how I write, you know, so uh, so I think I will just uh, leave it there and um, maybe uh, we're gonna have a more discussion along this line in the future. I would say that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, thanks also to uh, Rocio for your comments. Um, please join us next week. As I said at the beginning, we'll be discussing the work of Professor Elizabeth Cohen. She's a political scientist at Syracuse. She has a new book out titled Illegal, How America's Lawless Immigration Regime Threatens Us All. We'll have a comment from Professor Maggie Peters, political scientist at UCLA, and we'd very much uh, look forward to seeing you on the call as well. Uh, have a, 